Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us here today. We apologize for uh, the delay. We had some uh, technology issues, uh, but uh, I would like, I'm Carolina Albernas, CEO of the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce based in Toronto, and I'll be your MC today for this first BCCC ESG Excellence Series, uh, focusing on ESG and capital markets, a view from Brazil and Canada, the first discussion organized by our ESG committee that was launched back in March. Um, so the, BS, the BCCC ESG committee was created to provide a forum for high level executives focusing on discussing the strategic aspects related to ESG and as a vehicle to strengthen and connect Brazil Canada best practices to global initiatives, brainstorm ideas and network. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, speakers will be available to answer questions during and after the presentation. Uh, all questions should be asked through the Q&A box located in the bottom of your screen. We have allowed attendees to upvote and answer questions to incentivize positive discussion. So feel free to add comments and questions throughout the presentations. We will also do our best to address all points raised during the Q&A session. That will be moderated by Rafael Benke, who's also moderating uh, the panel discussions. Just uh, for those who are not familiar with the BCCC, just a quick overview. We're a membership-based association that supports its members through networking uh, and information, as well as advocacy. And for nearly 15 years, we've been building relationships between Brazil and Canada, strengthening the bilateral relationship in investment, trade, best practices, and mutual growth and prosperity. Um, our uh, relationships are private and public, uh, featuring managing directors and decision makers from companies from all sizes. And our volunteer board of directors have expertise, knowledge, and connections that can only be found by being active players in the Brazil-Canada market. So if you're interested in learning more how the BCCC can support your company, please feel free to reach out uh, to me anytime. We're very excited about the program today. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Iman Kara, Manager, Portfolio Management Infrastructure at Brookfield Asset Management and also Vice Chair of the BCCC ESG Committee to say a few words during the opening remarks. Iman, uh, stage is yours. Thank you, Carolina. Um, so hello, everyone, and uh, welcome again to the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce ESG Excellence Series event today on ESG and capital markets. Uh, my name is Iman Kara, and like Carolina mentioned, I am the vice chair of the BCCC ESG committee. And outside of my involvement here, I work within ESG strategy and portfolio management at Brookfield Infrastructure Partners. So Carolina already gave you a great overview of what we do as well as the ESG committee, but maybe I'll go into a little bit more detail. So the BCCC was established in 1973 as, as a non-for-profit and independent business association uh, with the primary objective of fostering stronger commercial relationships between both Brazil and Canada. So the BCCC is led by a volunteer group of board of directors comprised of uh, renowned industry leaders and experts that conduct business between Brazil and Canada. So we play a vital role in linking players from Brazilian and Canadian private and government sectors, and we aim to facilitate great dialogue between both parties and assist members in identifying key opportunities to expand activities and further business interests. So the ESG committee today, where we're gathered here today, was created to advise the board of directors in all matters related to ESG and to really add value to our members through high level and strategic discussions, events and activities, as well as contribute to the public debate, not only between Canada and Brazil, but internationally as well. ESG is now at the forefront of many discussions and is a mandatory discussion in boardrooms and management, meetings for companies and investors all over the world. With sustainability always being considered a strategic decision, ESG has really formalized this discussion at a more identified level. The objective of our ESG committee is to really become the main point of discussion for Brazilian and Canadian companies on ESG matters and to be a vehicle to strengthen and connect bilateral and global best practices and initiatives, as well as to brainstorm ideas and to network. So ESG, it's quite topical for today's market. It's becoming a more of a core topic for several stakeholders, investors in particular, 
but also including lenders, customers, and communities. At Brookfield Infrastructure in particular, where I can speak from, we look at investor interest from both a public unit holder basis for Brookfield Infrastructure partners, as well as those investors that commit capital through our private funds. There are many areas of focus, which I'm sure many of you would align with, including climate change, diversity and inclusion, ESG integration, um, as well as ESG ratings. In the realm of things like climate change, we see topics diverge in regards to greenhouse gas emissions, net zero targets and how to achieve them, and climate change, both physical and transition risk assessments. In areas of diversity, we're really seeing a shift from focusing on just gender ethnicity to just gender diversity to also ethnic diversity as well. And within ESG ratings, which we're seeing much, much more of, we are seeing companies focus on various ESG frameworks to help them align with what rating agencies expect. All of this comes down to for what we see as ongoing management as well as monitoring, including things like ESG KPIs and targets, along with public disclosure. And with this enhanced focus that we're seeing today, we're finding it increasingly important to key in on what is meaningful to each business and their respective investment thesis to develop a sustainable and profitable strategy. So that's what brings us all here today. We're really gathered for our first event in our newly launched BCCC ESG Excellence Series. This series will focus on events and activities that will promote development and sharing of knowledge and expertise on ESG matters to educate a broader audience on current ESG trends. Today, we're gonna to focus on ESG and capital markets, providing a view from both Brazilian and Canadian listed companies, beginning with the presentation from the Toronto Stock Exchange and B3, the Brazilian Stock Exchange. Today, more than ever, it's really important to discuss how stock exchanges have been supporting issuers with ESG reporting and best practices, and how companies are navigating the new ESG-related demands from investors. So our agenda today here is a great one, um, and we're going to begin with a presentation from TMX on ESG reporting and best practices. So I'm going to head oh, pass over the floor to TMX, or perhaps Carolina first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Iman, for the opening remarks. Before we start with the presentation, I would like to introduce then uh, the moderator of our discussion today, uh, Rafael Benke. Rafael is the CEO of Proativa, a consulting firm specialized in ESG strategies in Brazil, as well as the chair of our ESG committee. So, Rafael, stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Iman, for... for the opening remarks uh, that you kicked off uh, with uh, in our today's event. I think uh, you brought an excellent uh, background of uh, the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce, but also on how we are uh, starting uh, the, the construction of the SG committee uh, in, in the, the Brazil-Canada Chamber. Uh, I would like to, to make reference and to, to uh, note the presence of the Consul General uh, of Brazil, uh, Mrs. Vanja Nobrega, who is also uh, watching us. Uh, and especially, and with that, I salute all the leadership in the Brazil-Canada Chamber, Frederico Marques, who has been uh, in the genesis of, of, uh, of the idea of creating such a committee and was uh, 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 a big supporter of the idea of creating, not, not only of, of creating the committee, but giving room uh, to uh, the sustainability uh, perspective uh, within the BCCC events. Uh, as you may be following, the BCCC uh, have, have uh, extremely interesting and contentful uh, events uh, throughout the year, signature events uh, that uh, bring together uh, uh, the business community, the academic community, uh, NGOs to very interesting uh, discussions on doing business in Brazil, on uh, mining, on energy, on infrastructure, on, on various uh, topics. 
and, uh, and uh, 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 Federico and other leaderships, but I specifically mentioned Federico together with Carolina uh, have been really champions in bringing the sustainability topic uh, on board. And this is something we've been uh, supporting the chamber with. And I think uh, the crowning of this uh, approach was really to uh, create this committee that was very well explained uh, by Iman, who is our, our uh, vice chair. So uh, uh, I think if, if you have business in Canada or not, but above all, if you're interested in ESG, you're very welcome to, to join uh, the ESG committee, join the chamber, join the ESG uh, committee, join our discussions. I think it's interesting to, to say that uh, uh, in the committee, we have some internal activities, uh, uh, which uh, we call the, the knowledge building uh, initiatives where we have knowledge sharing of our of our uh, members and third parties that come on board to share their their knowledge on specific topics and we also have open initiatives like this one uh, where uh, our members here all all the companies that are uh, in this panel that I'm going to introduce very soon are members uh, uh, of of the chamber and and we come and discuss exchange ideas in an open way and 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 dialogue with with the general public. As Iman said very well, we 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 have Canadian Brazilian perspectives, but we also try to uh, to uh, bring the international dimension. And, and uh, most of us are exposed to to international uh, uh, perspectives on this topic, working different jurisdictions. So this is what the, what the committee is all about. So. Uh, very welcome everyone again to to this panel, and I think uh, uh, we we are bringing a very a very current uh, topic in 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 the DSG discussions uh, globally, which is the role of capital markets or the regulators of capital markets uh, worldwide, and uh, how ESG. Uh, is uh, being referenced for companies that are listed uh, uh, in stock exchanges worldwide. Once I am an investor and I am putting my money in companies that are listed, how much do I know about ESG practices? How much the listing process uh, is developing uh, its, uh, its references in a way that investors can have more clarity around uh, the risks that they, they are exposed to or the opportunities that they may be even incentivizing by buying those stocks. So there is a myriad of, of, uh, of uh, uh, aspects that come to the discussion when we are talking about uh, capital markets and uh, ESG. Uh, so uh, we have a, a very plural uh, panel, uh, uh, and, and I think uh, this uh, platform established of, this, of, of, uh, of uh, panelists here will, will bring uh, interesting perspectives. Uh, we have uh, the, the stock exchanges, Brazil and uh, Canada, we have companies that are listed in both stock exchanges and that are exposed to, to capital markets and, 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 uh, and uh, follow uh, international ESG uh, best practices. And uh, we also have the presence of, uh, of uh, uh, a law firm uh, that is very involved in capital markets, in listing, and also ESG uh, for, for the panel, and also for the closing remarks. Uh, I think with closing remarks, uh, we, we will count uh, on uh, Luciano. Luciano is, is also the vice chair of, of, of the SG committee, and he will bring the, the, the closing remarks also from, from a law firm that is also very involved in, in listing and in two jurisdictions. They have actually a physical presence uh, in Canada beyond Brazil. So uh, with that, uh, um, uh, we, 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 let, me, let me introduce who is part of this panel. So first of all, uh, Elisa Riego, uh, Elisa uh, is uh, the product and service innovation head uh, with uh, TMX. Uh, we have uh, Rogério Santana, uh, who is the head of client relationship with uh, B3. Uh, then uh, uh, from stock exchanges to companies, we'll start with uh, Felipe Guardiano. He is the vice president of sustainability and uh, strategy planning for Nexa. 
then uh, we'll, we'll have uh, João Kleber Cardoso, who is the CFO of Aura Minerals. And, uh, and uh, then we'll have Camila Goldberg, who is a partner uh, 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 specialized in, uh, in uh, 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 capital markets uh, and will bring a very interesting regulatory and policy making perspective uh, for, for us. So uh, the way that the panel will flow is we will start with initial remarks by uh, all the panelists. Uh, these initial remarks will, will bring uh, uh, an idea of where we are at uh, now in terms of uh, uh, capital markets, uh, companies, business, and, and this relationship with ESG, uh, and how did we get to this point. Uh, we will then engage in some uh, uh, deeper analysis of some segments of this uh, kickoff by the panelists. Uh, uh, we will then uh, collect some of the questions that you uh, uh, participants uh, will share with us via chat. So feel free to ask your questions, to ask for clarifications, specific points you'd like to hear from the panelists. And uh, I will moderate these questions uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the panelists. And then we'll go to uh, final remarks uh, by the panelists bringing uh, some uh, uh, forward-looking uh, uh, perspective, some future and trends perspective of, uh, of the relationship of ESG and capital markets. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, sh uh, shift the, 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 the panel now uh, to our first panelist. Uh, let me give the floor to Elisa Riego. Elisa, please. At I this see. point, uh, sorry, Lisa, to, to <laughs> run over you. I, I think at this point, all panelists are very welcome to open their cameras so that we, we uh, everybody can see uh, our faces. Thank you very much. And Elisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, Rafael, and uh, thank you to you and uh, BCCC. Uh, thank you very much for having me first time uh, speaking with uh, your your membership. Uh, as Raphael said, I am uh, the head of product and service innovation for Toronto Stock Exchange and TSX venture listed companies. Uh, basically, I produce products and services that will help them with their growth uh, as companies on our marketplace. And more recently, uh, obviously, the focus has been very much on uh, ESG and what resources we can bring to the table. Uh, this does include education, which has been a large focus to start uh, with our market to help our issuers. Rafael, did you want me to go into more about uh, perhaps history or just the just general intro? Yes, it, you can go a little deeper and already bring a little bit of the ESG component, please. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So I know uh, Raphael and other panels, we talked earlier about maybe talking about the history a little bit. And so when we looked um, initially uh, quite a few years back in terms of what issuers were doing, a lot of the reporting uh, at the time, not necessarily what we see today, but probably more so corporate uh, responsibility papers that were being written, um, it was more focused, obviously, in the sectors of mining, who were quite aware of additional um, reporting that they had to do by nature of their business, oil and gas and the financials. They were probably the sectors that had reports that dealt with matters of ES and G at the time. Um, and those were long narratives, um, full reports. And I think out of that, Canada had some great leaders in terms of reports and that kind of has grown and evolved as we see today in sustainability or ESG reports, um, more often um, following a framework or standard. But by and large, and still today, uh, back then it was very much our index, index constituents and still today we see that while a greater uh, number of index constituents are the ones that are reporting, um, you know, this is causing some issues with investors getting access to information. And so uh, we see part of our 
uh, role is to encourage and provide resources to help motivate, um, explain opportunities to the mid cap and small cap issuers that we have listed on our, our two uh, exchanges. Um, I think, you know, the index constituents, there was a lot of pressure um, and still is coming from uh, proprietary raters as well as um, index providers. Uh, so um, they would put out their own questionnaires and that still exists today. And so what, what is the um, impetus to the mid and small cap that are not on indices to really report? And so over the last few years, but even earlier, uh, TMX has been working in trying to provide the um, awareness as to what the benefits are for issuers in terms of providing either metrics or full reports uh, as it pertains to ESG. So to start, we really did focus on the education to help issuers understand um, the need and the opportunity. Um, so we started off with a very basic guide that really went step by step um, to help our issuers understand um, what material uh, ESG materiality assessments were and why they're important. Um, we also came out with an education platform that housed all kinds of assets like podcasts and recordings and events um, that we ourselves produce, but also working with many Canadian and international experts and consultants, because we realized we alone are not the experts in this. Um, we also moved ahead in offering one-on-one -on -one sessions with our issuers to really help them um, understand how ESG reporting um, can result in better performance, lower cost of capital, and perhaps take that back to the board um, because oftentimes you need the board buy-in to get things started. Um, tone at the top we recognize as being something that's pretty, very critical, especially in setting up the governance um, component of ESG, uh, which is really where you have to start. Um, along the way as well, we've developed uh, well, we've always had the ability to list bonds, but uh, more working on um, the listing and trading of both corporate and governance, uh, governance sustainability ESG bonds, um, and also came out with many ESG related um, indices as well. But very recently, we also announced a strategic alliance with IHS Markets, which is a, a global uh, data provider, um, and it's with it pertains to their ESG reporting repository. Um, we saw many benefits in telling our issuers and explaining to our issuers the benefit of this repository. A, it's free. It's a place that they can amplify the distribution channel of reports and or just metrics um, that they may have as it pertains to ESG um, related topics. Um, they have insights uh, into uh, peer analysis about what other peers are doing in their industry, or even um, looking at uh, analysis between different frameworks and standards that are out there. Where are the gaps in my current report and where uh, are there opportunities to perhaps move my SASB reporting into GRI, um, as well as just even a place to get started. Um, there's templates that they can use to help uh, drive the creation of uh, the reports. So we really think that it's very important, uh, again, just to repeat uh, some of the things that we need to mobilize all of our issuers, not just the large caps who are already leaders in the global um, environment, but also the mid and small cap issuers that we have listed on our two exchanges. And really to do that, we try to highlight the opportunities for them you know, as they're small, perhaps they're working in only one uh, jurisdiction, it's much easier for them to look at their operations and perhaps to report uh, prior to getting large and growing where you're working with uh, more multi-jurisdictional ESG mandates or um, regulation that might be out there or having to work with different operations. Um, but it, again, also just going back to lower cost of capital, uh, resiliency, um, and, and, and uh, you know, hopefully performance, lower cost of capital, all of that represents a huge opportunity um, and overall just visibility on a global uh, landscape. 
X and Iman, that's that's a uh, X and Elisa. That's a very good uh, good introduction, and uh, we will we'll get back to you on more details about this uh, this very interesting approach and uh, uh, and uh, appealing approach of not only focusing on on the big uh, listed companies, but also smaller listed companies and how how do you address these differences and how how do you help to level the playing field of of, uh, of listed companies uh, for for ESG uh, development right so um, uh, let's let's hear now from a Brazilian perspective uh, Rogério please uh, hello everyone uh, first of all Thank you for BCCC team to promoting this discussion today to invite me here to be here and congrats, congrats to you and all my, my partners here in this panel today uh, to be part of this discussion. So a very brief introduction about myself and about B3. Uh, I'm currently responsible for the relationship with uh, two different groups of clients in the exchange. I'm responsible for the relationship with issuers listed or not listed. So we have initiatives uh, targeting companies that are preparing themselves to be listed at some points. So not, not only already listed companies. And I'm also responsible for the relationship with uh, local asset managers in Brazil. So two very important players in the ESG discussion in capital markets, right? And for the ones that are not familiar with B3, B3 is not only the, the exchange in Brazil, so it's the, the result of a few mergers that happened over the last 15 years in Brazil. So currently we manage the stock exchange, we manage the derivatives exchange, we also manage the largest uh, OTC platform in Brazil. And it's important because when we discuss opportunities or initiatives in the debt markets, uh, decarbonization credits and other things. We are talking about OTC uh, products. So it's we also play a role here. And also finally, we provide infrastructure that support banks uh, in providing credit for individuals and companies and so on and so forth. So it's a, a very large group uh, spreads in the entire financial system in Brazil. And the, the track record of B3 in the ESG agenda is, I would say, is very long. It's been part of our strategy for a long time. If we go back to two decades ago, we're going to find initiatives, very important uh, landmarks that we, we fix it, like the launching of Easy, that was the, the fourth sustainability index in the world. We also were the first exchange in the world to join the United Nations Global Compacts. A few years later, we launched the first um, carbon efficient index in Brazil. We also are uh, founding signatures of the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative organized by WFE. Uh, we also are the first exchange in the Americas to join the Women's Empowerment Principles. And more recently, we just concluded and announced a very relevant revamp in the methodology of EASY, that is our main sustainability index. And currently, our uh, efforts in the ESG agenda are organized um, on three different pillars. The first one is related to B3 as a company. So we are not only an exchange that organize the market and manage different platforms, but we are, we are also a company for profits, which has its own responsibilities and commitments. So there is a very large group of initiatives from diversity to being carbon neutral and, and other, other things that are part of our uh, internal initiatives to make sure that we practice the, the walk the talk. So. Uh, anytime we are face to face to a client, company, or investor, we need to make sure that when you look at when we look in house, we are practicing what we are promoting. The second pillar has to do with promoting uh, ESG best practice in the Brazilian markets. 
So a few examples of initiatives that we do, uh, there are a group of uh, events, training, education. Uh, we, two years ago, we launched an uh, education hub that brings contents from pro produced by ourselves, from partners as well. Uh, and there are more than 40 different contents for investors, individuals, institutional investors, issuers related to the ESG agenda. Uh, we also uh, work very closely with CVM, that is the Brazilian SEC, in fostering uh, best practice in Brazil. So in the past, uh, we helped them to introduce the compliant tax plan concept related to uh, sustainability reports for listed companies in, in, in a document that we call reference form in Brazil. There is a equivalent to the 20F uh, under the North America regulation uh, that later was uh, introduced in a reform of the rule uh, as a requirement, not on no longer as a compliant explain. More recently, we uh, we worked with them in the public hearing related to the rule that established the, the listing requirements for Brazilian companies, uh, bringing uh, additional disclosure requirements in terms of uh, environment, social, and governance. Uh, so the, the three key aspects in this agenda. And probably the most relevant uh, initiative we have in this second pillar that is promoting best practice is a special listing segment called the Novo Mercado that was launched more than 20 years ago. And basically, uh, this listing segment introduced additional corporate governance requirements for companies uh, like one vote, one share, minimal number of uh, independent board members. More recently, in, in a review of the rules, we add additional compliance, internal controls requirements, and so on and so forth. So uh, when you look at the numbers since then, by far the majority of the new listed companies in Brazil over the last 20 years are listed in Novo Mercado because investors recognize that as an excellence uh, place in terms of corporate governance. And the third pillar has to do with products. Uh, as Eliza mentioned in, his, in her opening, products are very, very important to induce uh, and promoting um, best practice. Uh, indexes is the best example. I already mentioned uh, Easy and ICO2. We, we are, we, coincidentally today, we launched the the 2021 uh, process for ICO2. Uh, one month ago, we launched the process uh, for EASY under the new methodology that I mentioned. So uh, we do believe that uh, this kind of index is that will be benchmarked by derivatives, by ETFs for passive funds. It's a very important tool to engage companies because they will see that these investors are uh, looking for companies that are committed with this agenda and a very pragmatic way to show that is being part of an index. Uh, and we also have, uh, as I mentioned, initiatives in the OTC business. So we are promoting uh, discussions to develop the green bonds or sustainability linked bonds market in Brazil. Uh, it is still very, very incipient, but definitely uh, there is rule to, de to develop that. We also have uh, a specific product called Sibiu, that is a, a Brazilian decarbonization credit uh, created by the government a few years ago, and that is used by the fuel uh, segment in Brazil, companies uh, that create credits can sell it to fuel distributors in the chain to help them to neutral, to meet their, their targets set by the governments. And just to closing uh, my, my opening remark here, we see B3 as a, as a kind of a hub that is in a privileged position to connect investors and companies 
investors in different stages of developments uh, in this agenda, uh, and companies, large, small, and private companies that are that want to uh, improve their practices and enhance uh, what they are uh, doing today. So we we try to be this place where these connections can take place, and it's what we do, and we hope we can we can do more with partners in this agenda. Rogério, thank you so much. It's it's extremely interesting uh, what you brought to the table. I think this these different dimensions that B3 is, uh, is uh, working on, B3 as a company, uh, how you're engaging to promote these best practices, these, uh, some traditional products, some innovative products that you're bringing on board. I think it would be interesting to explore that a bit and the relevance of capital markets in this transition we are going towards new economy, right? Uh, with, uh, with these new products you're, you are uh, uh, designing and launching. Uh, I think when we pick up uh, with you uh, on, on deepening the conversation, it will be interesting to take the opportunity of this launch, the, the coincidental launch of, uh, of your 2021 process for the ICO2. I think it will be interesting too if you could uh, uh, give, it won't be a spoiler anymore because you've uh, launched it, but uh, if you can, can bring some more uh, on that, and, and, and also maybe some hints, uh, uh, maybe in your, your, your closing remarks or, or, or in our discussions about the, the revamp of the, the easy methodology, right? I think it's, it's also interesting for this, this public. Uh, now now we, we are going to shift uh, from, uh, from the stock exchanges uh, to companies, right? Uh, so when the, the rubber hits the road, uh, and uh, uh, we are going to, we, we have two, two mining companies with us, uh, Nexa and, and Aura Minerals. And uh, I think uh, for the purposes of this discussion to have mining companies, it's, uh, it's a wealth of knowledge. I think uh, mining companies and the mining sector ha has been in the interface or have been in the interface with social, environmental, and governance uh, aspects uh, for uh, from from its creation, <laughs> from ages, right? And uh, the the interface and complexity of these relationships uh, uh, brings a lot of learning. So even if we have had some uh, recent uh, episodes that I think uh, traumatizes society as a general. I think we have to be very careful not to throw the baby with the cold water. I think uh, probably in the mining sector lays a lot of the answers for uh, our migration to the new economy. Uh, uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, 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 learning lessons in this sector, not only because of, of recent episodes, but the cumulative experience of the various uh, decades uh, working in, in this area uh, uh, with potential high impact, with a, a high risk and how the company, the, how these sectors that are so necessary for the new economy uh, are, have been managing uh, these risks and, and impact. So I think uh, it's very welcome that we have two mining companies on board to discuss about uh, ESG matters, two companies that are listed uh, 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 on both sides of the of the of this dialogue, uh, and uh, that are new, that are not new to the subject. So I think uh, that we'll start with Felipe, and then uh, and then go to Clever, if that's all right. And uh, and I think a, a good starting point, maybe Felipe, you're you're uh, 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 an old hand, as you say, in North America, in this, in, in the mining sector, you've been, uh, uh, you've, you've been through a, a lot of these discussions, and uh, a lot of these discussions are not new. Of course, there are a lot of novelty in these discussions, but uh, a lot of it is not new. It will be very interesting to hear from you uh, where where are we coming from, where we are at now. Uh, from someone with such an experience as you and all the efforts that uh, Nexa are, uh, is doing for, for excelling in this area. So, uh, Felipe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, 
I would like to thank the BCCC for having this event and inviting me over. It's, a, it's an honor to be here uh, talking about this subject. This subject is very dear uh, to me as a professional and as a human being. Um, I think we're, we're uh, shifting uh, from stages here. We're in a very interesting moment, if you will, in the world and in the mining sector. Uh, we are also listening and hearing this jargon, ESG, and what does that mean? And why didn't we think of it before? So I'll do some, I'll, do, uh, I'll navigate through it a little bit. And then Rafael, you can poke me if you want and provoke me in any direction you like. But um, the fact is, like Rafael said, the mining industry has been living with uh, the concept of sustainability for a long time. Um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the mining sector as a whole didn't care much about uh, social relations, but it did care about the uh, 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 environment. And then it strengthened its worry about environment because society demanded it. Society as a whole demanded that uh, mining it used to be very easy to get a license to mine a deposit. It would take half a year and there, be, there you go, you got your license. Now it takes three, four, five years to get licenses. All the licenses required. You get license for drilling, you get license for putting a road on, you get license for many things. So environment is not nothing new to us. We have been progressing on this avenue and we have been uh, progressing on our initiatives and our actions, how to treat the environment and so forth. Uh, in social, on the social side, the S part of the ESG, uh, I think we have evolved uh, throughout the years, but I think we're not as advanced as we are in S and in E, in environment. Um, uh, but we are, we, we can feel the demand to evolve quickly. Uh, we have seen the tragedies that uh, Rafael mentioned, but not only that, we can see that, you know, uh, to, to get a project on, first of all, you need a deposit. Second of all, you need approvals. And approvals come from institutions, from government, but also from social society as a whole, communities, et cetera. And if you don't have that, you don't have a business, you don't have a deposit. So we, we have to evolve and we're evolving for a long time on social, and the governance, which is the G part of ESG, uh, the G part of ESG, I would say it's the newest one. It's where you measure how you do things. It's where you assess. It's where you get accountable. It's where you warrant or you guarantee that you're going to do the proper job, the proper routines, the proper procedures, both for environment and for social, the social side. And this ESG concept, uh, like I said, is not new. Uh, before that, we, uh, it's just a recent uh, terminology. I've been hearing about it about for two or three years and it started in the financial side of the world. Uh, and of course it went through all the industries as a whole, particularly to the mining sector, not particularly, but mining sector deals with nature more than supermarkets do. So, uh, we, we, we feel that we have to uh, comply with SG and the society is demanding that from us. So that's the, the story in a nutshell. Before that, we used to call sustainability and we have a tripod, which is environment, social and economics. And now we are evolving the concept. What is different this time around? In my perspective, Rafael, what is different is that now everybody's talking about it, so it's different. So second, we're measuring it and we're assessing it. It's different. Before we talk sustainability, we have some indicators, but now we have, we are coming up, it's still in the workings, but we're coming up with a true set, thorough set of indicators and thorough set of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and how, how you can show that you are truly a company, mining or not, a company that cares about uh, environment, social relations, and governance. Uh, 
and how do you guarantee that through governance? So the, the, I think this time around is different. We're, we're, we're changing paradigms, if you will. Uh, we have lived for a long time on let's take, what, let's take what we need from the earth in terms of agriculture, minerals, and so on. Now we continue doing that, but we have to, the, the, the part that we have to do to really take care of the earth is changing quite fast and it's accelerating and the demand is changing. And companies will simply have to comply. Uh, that's no discussion about that. So you, you introduce me as an old jock of mining. I don't like that very much, but okay, I have to recognize I'm not a young fellow anymore. But if you talk to people my age about mining, they're gonna say, yeah, yes, gee, it's the same thing. We have been doing that for years and so on. It just changed the logo. It's not quite that. Yes, the logo has changed, but it's not quite that. The person that says that is not fully aware of what's going on here. What's going on here? It's not what we do. What's going on here? How are we gonna be demanded to do it? By the way, I would like to uh, put forward to you, uh, mining industry is not going anywhere. The mining industry is gonna be here now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. That's not gonna change. What's gonna change is because we need the product of mining industry to our daily lives. And, and, and that's, that's settled. Even though most of us don't know that that's settled, it is. What's, what is um, not going to be sustained is our mining companies that do not understand this message. And at Nexa, I'm from Nexa, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm from Nexa Resources, and we do understand the message. And what I'd like to say is that companies uh, that don't understand the, the demand from society, and when I say society, I mean every stakeholder. I mean the governance, I mean the communities, I mean the society, the newspapers, the, the universities, everybody. If we don't understand what is being demanded from us through ESNG, and other stuff. Yes, NG is just a, one of the focuses, if we, but it's pretty strong right now. If we don't understand that, we're bound to fail. So uh, our company will disappear. So uh, the challenge to us is to survive and to do a good job. That's, that's the challenge. We, we have changed centuries. And when we change century, we change paradigms, we change a lot of things. And today we have to understand what is being demanded and we have to uh, do it. Um, I guess my initial thoughts are, are I'll, I'll leave it at that, and then I think we're going to debate it some more. I took already seven minutes of your time. Thank you. Uh, and and I'm, I'm looking forward for the next stage of this debate. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Felipe. I think it was a very interesting uh, background of, of this transformation we are, we are living, a testimony of, of this uh, uh, migration uh, uh, that, that we are doing from uh, the sustainability background uh, towards DSG. And I think you, you gave very precise examples of what you are noticing as, as a change uh, in terms of, uh, of a structured agenda, of the tangibility, the objectiveness of the discussions that uh, really allow uh, a better grasp and, and maybe more consequence to, the, to this discussion vis-a-vis -vis some of earlier discussions that uh, were maybe broader, more intangible, more intentional. And, and, and uh, I think uh, we're talking about uh, 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 a perspective that uh, uh, we will also facilitate management, right, of, of, these, of these aspects. So uh, uh, the famous ESG gap analysis, the famous planning uh, uh, and, and actual, actual management control performance of ESG factors. And, and I think this only occurs if we see the kind of transformations you're attesting from what we saw in the past, vis-a-vis uh, -vis sustainability. So definitely it's not a new uh, subject, 
but is a different approach, an approach that probably will result in more, in more impact or the visibility of more impact, the visibility of, of a better or worse performance through these characteristics that you brought forward. Uh, Carolina, we have to make sure that we get approval from, from Felipe to use his speech as, as maybe one of the capacity building courses we can, we can do very soon. But, but I think, uh, 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 Felipe, we will migrate now uh, from your uh, remarks to Aura Minerals, uh, who also is experiencing uh, these very, very uh, same uh, aspects. And maybe, uh, Kleber, you can bring to us uh, some of, of, of your views. If, are they coincidental to what uh, Felipe is bringing? Do you see it a little different? Maybe you give some examples. Uh, how are you feeling the market? Uh, I think we have a privilege here with uh, Kleber to have a CFO and uh, a CFO of mining company. Uh, Kleber, are you talking about uh, earnings and money or are you also talking about ESG with your, with your investors, with, uh, with market and so on? I think it'd be very interesting to hear you. So Kleber, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rafael. Thanks, everyone, and, and congratulations to the Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce uh, for having this uh, event. Always important talking about ESG. I have, Rafael, a quick, quick presentation here just to, to introduce you, or maybe uh, not the, the whole audience is familiar with the question. Uh, I will not, not talk about financials here, uh, but I just anticipate one of her questions is. Uh, nowadays, I think no company can have an uh, uh, investor's call, an investor's meeting without talking about this. Uh, we, we're going to get some more details that later. But then, uh, so basically, just introducing uh, our minerals. Our minerals is uh, a very fine growing uh, mining company. We have operations uh, throughout our projects throughout the Americas, uh, in Mexico, in the US, Brazil, the United States, and Colombia. Uh, we produce uh, gold and copper in those jurisdictions. We have been listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange since 2007 and on the B3 Stock Exchange uh, since last year. We completed uh, the, our IPO of BDRs uh, last July. And we are a growing company. Uh, we grew our production uh, by 67% between 2019 and 2020. And going to 24, uh, we have uh, a plan to double the size of the company. Uh, so we're, we're a new story, but uh, a growing case. And also uh, to talk a little bit uh, what we do in terms of ESG with the company, I'd like to share with you one slide uh, that we try to bring this slide in most of our internal meetings here. It brings our vision of the company and uh, one concept that we call Aura 360 Mind. So our vision is to be one of the most trusted, responsible, well-respected, and results-driven mining companies. And here on the right side, we see uh, this framework that we call Aura 360. That's basically uh, to every step, every important, every important decision we take here at Aura, we evaluate what's the impact, for example, in the community. We need to be respectful with the local community. So uh, we employ, we hire uh, many locals in our operations. Uh, we give back uh, through many, many initiatives during COVID, for example, which is not uh, made donations of masks or medical equipment, but also brought, for example, healthcare professionals to educate local people about uh, safe procedures. Uh, so we, we have to be very close with that. Then sustainable, and, and going to something that we were talking a little bit about, uh, I agree totally, uh, in, in, in even more than that, I believe mining companies, they are not only unavoidable, but they add a lot of that, you know. We wouldn't have uh, iPhones, uh, computers, some calls, etc., without minerals. Uh, and even more than that, I think mining companies are underrated. Why? Why a copper company is not as sexy as Tesla, for example? Because uh, there is no uh, electrical vehicles, no no engines without copper and other lithium, other minerals, though. So it, we we're just part of of, of that supply chain. And should uh, we, we should talk more about that as well. 
the thing, the important thing is uh, being sustainable. Uh, as, as you all talking, and we all know uh, mining, uh, we do with nature, interact with nature, so it's important to be sustainable. Uh, but the good news is uh, that the mining companies, they can be sustainable. So you can have mining activity and sustainability, and, and that's part of the core for it as well. Then we have the employees dimensions. Internally, we even call ESG ESG because we like to bring employees. Uh, in that dimension, uh, zero accidents. Uh, safety is the most important item. So we have a zero acid accidents target for our uh, business units. Uh, we manage that very closely. Meritocracy uh, talks a little bit about our culture. Uh, we measure performance, so we reward high performers. Uh, we push and, and create incentives for feedbacks. Uh, actually, we have a process, for example, that twice a year we have a feedback session that not only the top down feedback process, but also uh, upward feedback. In, when, when people, they evaluate the leaders. Uh, so so that's uh, all of that values the employees. That's a critical part uh, of ESG and to put that in place as well. And finally, what we call the company side, that we have innovation and responsibility in general, but it deals with corporate governance, like good management, and also uh, results, no? The companies, they need to be profitable, generate shareholder returns, so that and being reinvested in the business uh, in, in this uh, positive cycle. Uh, so if you see ESCG is part of this, this concept that is much broader. Uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, we try to bring this to our internal presentations that we have here at our and all jurisdictions. We, we have the target to bring it to all presentations. We're, we're almost there. Uh, because I think maybe the, the main point here is uh, this is an enterprise mission. You, you, you cannot just say, okay, yes, it is a top management and a C level agenda. So let's put that some targets and then we're looking to the to the market. There is no way. Uh, you, you, you need the whole organization and going towards the same direction. So we see. Besides the actions that we take, it's very important to put that in our mission, to put that in our values, and talk to our employees uh, as often as possible about this, that it, so that it, it becomes part of the culture of the company. So, uh, a little bit about Aura Rafael. I don't know if you have any other thing about the introduction. This is great, uh, Clever. Thank you so much. And I think. Uh, uh, the examples, the concrete examples of what you were focusing on is, is very interesting. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you during the, the, the next uh, segment when it will be interesting to hear from you how in practice uh, you as a CFO uh, ha has been called by the market, by your by in your role of investor relations, how how is this uh, this exchange occurring? What are uh, the kind of questions that appear? I think this is interesting for the public uh, to hear firsthand from from you. Uh, thank you again for introductory remarks. Let's let's now hear from Camila Goldberg. She, as I said, she's she's a partner at uh, at BMA, BMA, uh, a law firm. Uh, and uh, and uh, Camila, I think uh, your introductory remarks also come very uh, timely uh, as a wrap up of the introductory uh, uh, part of our of our uh, panel. And and, uh, and uh, you come from a perspective that is very relevant uh, for uh, uh, setting the tone and maybe uh, setting the bar of where we are at, right? I think uh, internationally, we are seeing a lot of uh, discussion on these, as, as I was saying in, in the beginning of our panel. Of course, there is a lot of uh, voluntary aspects, a lot of uh, 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 dynamics uh, uh, around ESG and capital markets. We are seeing everything TMX and B3 uh, have been doing, uh, but uh, you know, uh, speaking with an attorney that is specialize in this area, there are some tough questions to be answered on how we evolve the regulatory framework uh, 
uh, of ESG aspects for capital markets, because we are talking about responsibility, about uh, risk, material risks, about uh, liability and how this may or not impact uh, investors. We are talking about uh, disclosures, transparency, precision in information. So uh, a, a lot of aspects that uh, we are happy to have an expert on board to, to clarify and bring, uh, bring uh, uh, the scenario where, where we are at. So uh, Camila, uh, uh, let us know about it. We are very curious. Okay, Rafael. So first of all, thanks for having me here. Thanks for the invitation, Rafael, Carolina, and the rest of the members of the BCCC ESG committee. It's a pleasure to be here with other panelists and of course with everyone who is watching us this afternoon. So thank you very much. And, and yes, I think that we have this, this great topic here in front of our hands to discuss uh, and, and how not only the market itself, but also the regulators and, and investors and policymakers around the world are treating uh, the issue of ESG that, and that was, uh, and, and I think that everyone uh, here touched on that very well, but specifically, uh, getting the words that Felipe said that uh, uh, how uh, the market and, and the companies and in its relationship and, and Kleber touched on this as well very uh, 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 very well to how companies, issuers and, and, and asset managers and investors have been uh, uh, seeing this great and giant shift uh, in front of our hands specifically after I would say last year was was like this this major moment for for the shift uh, to be observed by uh, companies and investors and with of course pandemic and all the issues that it brought and and that also brought on regulators and I'm going to touch on that uh, uh, a, a very important moment to stop and, and review its policies around the world. So what I'm going to do just to focus a little bit and try to make it uh, uh, more concrete to uh, all of our friends here today. I'm gonna share a presentation, try to do that very briefly, and then we can uh, jump into a discussion thereafter. So just give me a minute. Can you hear me? Now, oh, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, so I think that uh, uh, the main point that uh, we wanted to touch uh, is the rules on ESG report, right? Because uh, the fact that uh, companies uh, are, are receiving pressure uh, from, from the market and from its investors on this, what we can call as this new stakeholder model versus our old shareholder model in which uh, the main objective of a company was to bring uh, profits to its uh, shareholders against this, this new stakeholder model in which a company has to provide long-term value for its shareholders, yes, but not only to shareholders, but to stakeholders in general, and that would comprise uh, employees, that would comprise uh, 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 people on communities around the companies, creditors, uh, and, and all types of uh, 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 investors in general. Uh, that uh, has put a very, very important element on, on reporting uh, requirements. And why is that? Because that would be a way for companies uh, to inform and to disclose to the market how they are treating ESG teams inside their organizations uh, in terms of uh, uh, climate change um, uh, matters, in terms of uh, uh, diversity issues, in, in terms of course of uh, uh, governance uh, and uh, environmental matters. Uh, and, and how investors would be able to compare such companies and, and uh, based on such uh, information will be able to make their investment decisions. So we are talking about uh, qualitative disclosures when, when we are dealing, of course, with uh, how companies are treating these matters inside their organizations, but also we are talking about quantitative metrics because there are a lot of uh, quantitative metrics such as, and of course, the, the most no uh, one throughout the market, which is uh, reduction of uh, carbon gas emissions and, and, and goals uh, throughout time, but also all other sets of KPIs that can be used uh, as companies to show their, uh, their improvements in terms of sustainability issues, that it's a very, very uh, common metric, for instance, when we are talking about sustainability bonds. 
Uh, also, when uh, uh, it's an opportunity that the company can uh, explain uh, its strategy, its business model, and how this ESG component will, of course, uh, play out uh, into, into the reality and, uh, of a company, as Kleber was saying. It's not only talking about revenues, but also uh, how the ESG component uh, will impact not only revenues, but a strategy moving forward on the companies. And of course, there is this element which is very important when we are talking about disclosures, which is uh, how to make uh, statements that the companies are in disclosures in general consistent with uh, the reality of the company. And that's what we call, and it's a very uh, known concept uh, these days, which is the risk of greenwashing, right? Which, what, what is the greenwashing? Greenwashing is exactly uh, the risk of as ESG was this from, I would say one day to another, I know that this is a radical statement, but uh, the, the, in the, the relevance that it gained, it was kind of a, 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 a very uh, uh, immediate shift. And then a lot of companies started uh, putting together a ESG marketing strategy or a ESG uh, uh, type of disclosure that it's not 100% consistent with the, what, what they are actually doing. And considering that we do have still, and we are gonna touch on that, a lack of, uh, of standard rules uh, in certain jurisdictions regarding disclosure requirements, it's a little bit uh, easy for investors to get confused about the information that they are getting and the risk of greenwashing, what is to say not actual uh, 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 ESG best practices that uh, that the, the companies are trying to to sell to the market in certain cases. This is a very uh, important risk that also regulators uh, have to address. So, okay. So just trying to give uh, uh, some uh, view on different. Uh, just let me try to organize here because otherwise I can see what I'm showing to you guys, just a minute. Okay, no worries. Uh, so in terms of Canada, and I think that Elisa touched on that, uh, and also I'm gonna talk to, about Brazil, but Rogério touched on that uh, when uh, I think Rogério mentioned the Sustainability Stock Exchange Initiative, which is this global initiative that has been adhered by several stock exchanges throughout the world, trying to organize a, a collaboration model in which uh, uh, these stock exchanges will, in fact, uh, try to, to level the plane in terms of uh, disclosure requirements. So TSX uh, is adherent uh, to SSE, uh, follow different uh, indexes and, and offer ESG uh, team products. I think uh, it is a touch on that. Uh, the Canadian Securities uh, Agents uh, published a, a, a guidance. So I think we can say that uh, Canada as a jurisdiction is paying a hard attention to that, although there are still no mandatory disclosure requirements in terms of ESG. In terms of Brazil, and I think Rogério made a great uh, introduction on that, and yes, I think we have all to, to say to, to, uh, that B3 has been doing this wonderful job throughout the last two decades, initiating uh, like this uh, big, big uh, path here in Brazil regarding uh, corporate governance. And yes, in terms of sustainability, a lot has been done, and B3 has been involved in a lot of uh, initiatives and discussions in the Brazilian uh, capital markets. Um, and again, as mentioned to Rogério, but I think this is a very important point, so I'm going to uh, uh, restate that CVM is putting a place and has, has shared with the market in the first semester of this year a public hearing uh, with the intention to have a specific section on the, uh, the formulário de referência, the reference form, which is this X-ray similar to 20F, uh, in the US of public health companies that show to the market all the important information uh, pertaining to the company that, that investors have to have access in order to, to make their investment decisions uh, regarding public health companies. And there is this intention to have on the, the remodeling of the rules, which are expected to be enacted soon, but there is 
uh, this uh, section that it's going to be uh, reserved specifically to ESG teams. So that will be fantastic for Brazilian uh, capital markets uh, investors because there will be a way in which they will compare uh, public health companies in terms of their initiatives uh, and, and risks and uh, actions in terms of ESG. But still, uh, until this is enacted, also important to say, Brazil does not have uh, mandatory disclosure requirements. Also, uh, in terms of Brazilian, Brazilian initiatives, it's, it's interesting to point out uh, that Ambima, which is the, the self-regulatory association of uh, Brazilian financial institutions and, and uh, asset managers, uh, and capital markets in general, they are also putting together a task force that will uh, enact self-regulatory rules regarding uh, ESG uh, slash green sustainability funds that will be able to be uh, labeled as such if, of course, they would fulfill uh, certain requirements. And that is a fantastic uh, advance for uh, the asset managers and investors uh, industry, because we know that there are uh, uh, massive uh, uh, amount of funds in, 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 in the world at this point that has to be destined uh, to, to funds which are actually labeled uh, as ESG funds. So for Brazilian uh, funds industry, that's going to be uh, this huge initiatives initiative. So I would say that that are the, the, the biggest uh, uh, news that we are expecting in the Brazilian market, uh, form, uh, reference form and uh, uh, the Ambima ESG funds. On the United States, also uh, NASDAQ uh, is adherent to the SSE and is providing specific uh, 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 products and certain rules. And last week, and I think a lot have probably seen that, they enacted a, a, a new requirement in which uh, a, a public health company listed in NASDAQ, they would have in terms of business, in terms of diversity, they would have to have two board members. Uh, one has, would have to be a woman and the other one, uh, either uh, 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 someone uh, fulfilling ethnic requirements or uh, someone from uh, LGBT. Uh, uh, a member which is self-declared as uh, a member of LGBT. So this is fantastic as well uh, in terms of diversity initiatives. And also, yes, uh, SEC uh, is, uh, they, they are revising all uh, uh, listing and uh, uh, disclosures that have been made uh, in the uh, US uh, public market throughout the last decades and they are putting together a new uh, new set of rules that will also try to level the plane in terms of uh, disclosure requirements. And I would say that uh, uh, the uh, European Union they are the most uh, they are the most advanced uh, in terms of um, of what they've been doing. Uh, they already have uh, some sort of uh, uh, rules like a first level rules uh, in terms of disclosure for. Uh, public health companies and and financial uh, and, and financial uh, institutions, and and also some time, some uh, type of uh, 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 directions for non financial reporting uh, companies. So I think that if we uh, if we look at what's going on in Europe now, uh, it's something that uh, it's uh, it's coherent with other, uh, other uh, measures that they have been taking with the approval of the, the, the very aggressive uh, green deal that they want to put in place, uh, other type of uh, 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 decisions to, uh, that ha they have made on the financial market, for instance, approving uh, uh, climate change as a systemic risk in, in, in several jurisdictions. So I think that this is very coherent with other uh, other actions that Europe is doing uh, is putting in place now. Uh, just just to, to touch on on the problem, and I'll, I'll try to, to be more concise. But just, I think it's important to touch on uh, the the absence of uh, 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 a uniform 
uh, rating uh, uh, requirements for uh, uh, rating agencies that, and there are a lot of rating agencies at this, at this point that are following ESG uh, uh, requirements and, and putting in place uh, uh, some sort of ESG performance ratings. But the problem is that with the absence of uniformous uh, uh, a requirement for disclosures. There are different metrics as well for such a, uh, ratings to, um, uh, to, uh, to report uh, uh, their, uh, their, uh, uh, their guidance. So uh, in the end, there is, a, uh, the, the result, uh, although it's of course something that helps a lot investors to identify uh, who is who uh, on the SG uh, framework, it's also something that it's not 100% uh, asserted, for instance, as credit uh, uh, rating that are, are disclosed by the most important rating agencies in the world. Uh, this is uh, it's just interesting because it's a, state, a recent statement from SEC on this task force that they are putting in place saying exactly that uh, uh, the, the absence of clear rules in terms of uh, ESG requirements can lead to confusion on investors and risks, a new set of risks uh, for, for capital markets and investors in general, which are trying to navigate on the ES, uh, uh, ESG world. And, and that goes, put us back to the risk of greenwashing uh, that I was mentioning before. I think uh, as opening uh, statements that that was what I wanted to touch. And, uh, and I think that will give us plenty of uh, uh, information for future discussion with the rest of the panelists. So thank you, Rafael. Thank you very much, Camila. I think uh, you, you managed to do, in a nutshell, I think a snapshot of all the, the, the main pillars that we're seeing developing uh, regulation, policymaking in this area. I think uh, one of, one of the, the, the key aspects you raised is the gap that we are already finding uh, in terms of uh, practice and uh, and uh, reporting. So I think uh, this this first wave we are seeing of onboarding by companies uh, it is important. Uh, I think uh, uh, that companies get a, a fast snapshot, understand where they are at, and start uh, 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 bringing their parameters uh, to the table. But um, we, we need, uh, as I believe as Felipe was saying, or, or as, as Kleber was saying, we need to walk the talk, right? And, uh, and that means uh, the real impact, uh, the, 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 the real metrics, credible plans to get to this uh, objective. So I think uh, companies need to move very fast from these preliminary screenings that they are doing and preliminary framings that they are doing uh, into substance and, uh, and uh, core of, of, of their ESG practice and, and performance. And I think uh, this is a second wave that we'll see after this, this first uh, scratching on the surface uh, happens. And, and I think it's important, the message that you bring, Camila, that regulators are catching up, uh, especially when we talk about market. I think uh, if, if we take a reference internationally, we should look at uh, DEU developments. And uh, I think you, you brought the developments related to cap capital markets specifically, but then the transparency directive uh, the transparency directive, I think another factor that is correlated is the EU taxonomy. Uh, so uh, how, how funds are, are to be uh, uh, classified uh, in their different uh, categories. So all that brings more uh, 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 criteria, more reference to uh, some terminology that sometimes and in the recent uh, past has been using more loosely. So uh, with that, I think we will also mitigate the chance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, greenwashing, of ESG washing. And, uh, and this is a big red flag to all companies that they really uh, go over this hump of the initial work and really go into, into the crux of the issue. And I think the EU regulator is setting the tone, not only focusing uh, the market itself or uh, the stock exchanges, but also the whole ecosystem, as you're saying, right? So the rating agencies, all the 
all the uh, ancillary institutions and entities that are working in the system, bringing more consequence to what they are doing. So I think this is a clear message to all operators in this, in this field. Um, we were, all of us were very ample in terms of initial remarks. They were, uh, these were initial and comprehensive remarks that gave already, I think, uh, uh, our audience uh, 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 substance uh, beyond just uh, kickoff remarks. So uh, we, we are actually advanced in terms of time, and there are some uh, 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 specific aspects that we would like to go back to some of the panelists before they go to their closing uh, remarks. And uh, let me start with Rogerio. Uh, uh, Rogerio, uh, so we are very short of time. I, I'll ask all the panelists now to be very objective, but if you could give a little bit of color to two aspects of, uh, of your speech, and maybe we can uh, talk to the BCCC and plan another uh, event to go deeper into this, but uh, namely, number one, uh, the, the revamp of the EASY methodology, the ISE methodology, and uh, secondly, if you could uh, give us a, a little more uh, insight about uh, uh, today's launch. Okay, uh, thank you, Rafael, and I will bring this information. And also, make my closing remarks because I, unfortunately, I have a, a hard stop. And again, thank you for organizing that and inviting me here. Uh, and congrats to all all the panelists here to bring these insights. So. Uh, Easy, as I mentioned, was launched more than 15 years ago, and it, it became the main benchmark for ESG practices in Brazil. And, but there were some aspects of its methodology that was kind of outdated. So uh, this was exactly what to try to tackle in a more than one year process of engagement and hearings with stakeholders. And, and the main difference of the new methodology that was launched one, one month ago and that will be in place for the, the portfolio of 2022 is bringing a segmented questionnaire. So looking at the specificities of each segments and applying specific questions for, uh, for each segment. We are also uh, aligning in a better way the questions and requirements and standards with the GRI, SASB, B Lab, CDP, and so on and so forth. So, as a consequence, companies that are complying with these standards or guide, guidelines, they can more straightforward uh, apply and answering the ES ISC questionnaire. We are also bringing the uh, CDP reports and the rep risk rating as part of the methodology in terms of reputation, in terms of emissions. So these are some of the aspects that we are introducing for this new methodology. And the one last one, we remove it a restriction of up to 40 companies to be part of the index. Now, the, the companies that perform well, they will be there. And that is, we're gonna set a threshold according to the, the number of companies and the score of each company in the sample for each year to, to choose what's gonna be the size of the portfolio. It could be 30 companies or 50 companies, depending on how these companies will score. And shifting gears to the, the launching of ICO2 uh, today uh, morning, ICO2 is our carbon efficient index. It was launched 10 years ago. So we, we started today the process, the applying process for the 2022 uh, portfolio to, be, to join the index. And uh, we also have planned a revamp, a revamp of the methodology of ICO2 to, to be done in 2022. So there are scenes in the next chapter to be discussed here. Maybe in the next panel, we can bring this issue here happen. Rafael, and again, thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you so much, Rogério, and uh, thank you for your presence and uh, Beatrice support to this event. 
uh, uh, I know you have to 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 disconnect, so feel free for doing doing so. And let us shift now to Elisa. Elisa, I think one angle that uh, we we were eager to hear is about uh, smaller listed companies. So maybe you can bring a little bit of insight about that. And if you want to follow Rogério's model and already uh, uh, give give some of your closing remarks regarding trends, that would be great. Okay, and I'll keep it really brief as, uh, as I know that we're short on time. So I think for small companies, what's going to mobilize them is obviously to show them that there can be a return on investment. Um, they're already marginalized just being small cap. And so we don't want them to be further marginalized by not having any ESG disclosure because we know that it's no longer just institutional investors that are looking for this information. As many of us spoke today, it's really about stakeholder capitalism. So it doesn't matter what part of the ecosystem you're in, somebody's going to be looking for those metrics. And so we need to illustrate and tell our small cap issuers that this is about getting visibility and that there are ways to do it um, that it doesn't need to cost a lot. Um, as I mentioned, we did the endorsement with IHS Market for their ESG reporting repository because it is free. There is a place for them to start and it can be about ESG data, not about this big report. And of course, all the get education that we have available. So I guess just moving to trends and my closing remarks, maybe it's more of a wish and a hope rather than what I see. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of focus on supply chain. I think there already is, but more so. And I think they're going to shift, you know, the larger companies are going to actually start kind of shifting responsibility down that chain. And so a lot of those will be our small cap issuers that might get affected by this. Um, and so also, again, one of my hopes uh, as well is, again, this shift from a report that has a lot of narrative. So a lot of qualitative information that can be subjective and misinterpreted and going towards metrics that are comparable, um, but I'm not disqualifying uh, narrative, but I think that, um, I think it's important that at least for small cap, they start with the metrics, get a benchmark, get that visibility. The narrative will come, which will lend itself to engagement, which is what everybody needs. That is where the visibility comes from when they can uh, engage. I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much again for having me. Thank you, Elisa. That that was very interesting. And thank you for, for your wishful thinking, which, which we'll call a trend. Uh, and, and we do hope so that uh, metrics are uh, will be increasingly uh, useful uh, to, to, that, uh, to that purpose. Uh, so uh, Felipe and, uh, and uh, Kleber, uh, uh, a, a final question to you and then moving uh, towards uh, closing remarks. Uh, is the is the question that we were exchanging with you earlier? Uh, what are uh, what are those top two ESG questions that uh, are uh, uh, frequently asked uh, by investors? So, what, what what is the focus of investors right now when we speak uh, of of ESG? So, uh, Felipe Kleber, who goes first? Oh, I can okay, go first. Felipe? Uh, well, it's an interesting, uh, there are several questions, but uh, let's take a review on the last five years. NEXA got listed in 2017, October 2017. Of course, before you are listed, before you do an IPO, uh, you, you go around and you talk to investors, institutional investors, and so on we had to pray for them to ask anything related to environment or social or governance for that matter. We said, well, here's Felipe, he's our VP of you know, <laughs> sustainability. Would you like to ask him a question? No. Um, so there was no interest whatsoever in the fact that we do desalination of water, the fact that we do, uh, you know, dry stacking instead of uh, wet um, uh, wet tailings. And so they were just, okay, fine, 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 but let's look at the financial numbers. 
that was 2017. Today, we go quarterly to the market to report our quarterly results. And the CEO, the CFO are involved in those conferences. There are half of the questions are related, I would guess, half of the questions are related to ESG. And what they want to know is, we have uh, operations in Peru and in Brazil. What they want to know is, they talk about licenses, they talk about the choices that we're making when we have new projects like we do. We do have a new project in Mato Grosso and uh, are you gonna dry stack? Are you gonna have a tailings pond? Are, how are you gonna treat the water? What about the Indians around? What about the getting peros? What about the community? And are you building them a new hospital? And uh, there are several questions about that. So you, if you want to talk to, so, there's no particular question, but the, but, but the big questions are around social relations because they are fully aware, the investors are fully aware that if you're not, uh, if you're not, play, not playing your cards right, if you're not doing what it is that you must be doing in social relations, your project runs risks. And, uh, and they are now fully aware of that. Of course, um, Having said that, from 2017 to 2021, the, you know, the institutional investors, both in New York and Canada, or in Europe for that matter, they did not become experts in mining, for instance. So they ask about a lot, uh, CO2 emissions. That's a preferred question. And CO2 emissions, of course, global warming and so on, but to be honest, CO2 emission is not a big deal in mining. The big deal in mining, well, what do we have a lot in mining that we have to read up, get rid of, is tailings. When we mine a ton of ore, we take out 1% of copper. The other 99% we have to dispose in some way. And zinc is the same thing. And you know, uh, lead is the same thing. So, uh, it, 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 uh, they ask a lot about CO2. And we, when do you intend to be net zero in CO2 emissions? And, and, and of course, we have to worry about that because we burn diesel fuel. And you know, we're not talking only about uh, what we consume in terms of diesel fuel. Of course, we have to look at our energy sources. Most of our energy, 100% of our energy is hydroelectric power plants anyway, but that's a concern for them. So I, I assume I project, if you will, I guess, uh, in the near future, institutional investor will know better what are the nevralgic points of mining to ask uh, questions, more direct questions and more relevant questions for mining. Not that they ask questions that are not relevant, don't, don't get me wrong. It's just that uh, when they say CO2 is our focus, well, maybe the focus of an oil and gas company for us, so two is not that big a deal, but it is a deal. We have to deal with that, but there are bigger deals. And, uh, but social relations, they are fully aware of, and they ask uh, frequently about that. So that would be my two cents on your question. Excellent, Felipe. Kleber? Yeah, uh, I'll try to give a general uh, highlight what I see as most common. And each market, I think, even more important than that, I would say it varies a lot. You know, for not only investors, but also financial institutions. Also, we have investors, the sources of capital, the company, we have equity in that. That varies a lot. The investors and varies a lot according to the financial institutions. Uh, but in general, what I would say, uh, tailings in Brazil, last year we did our, our IPO, you know, we had more than one. Meetings. Uh, it was mostly focused in Brazil, but we had also effort in Canada, US, and Europe. We had to talk about uh, ESG, but we had to have a specific set of slides to talk about things. So I think that's considering what happened in Brazil. Everyone became like a change expert. They know if it's a string or downstream, if there is a community around or not. Uh, and that's much stronger in Brazil because everything that happened in Brazil. In Canada, we get lots of questions regarding more social, because most of our operations are in Latin America. 
uh, in, in Mexico, in some states, uh, there are some issues. We are also Operations on Honduras, uh, Mato Grosso, so there are lots of questions, especially after COVID as well, to understand are they in production operations, what are guys doing, are we controlling the spread of the virus among your uh, operations? So we got we we, we got lots of lots of those questions in Brazil. But I think it's more most questions are more regarding related to environments, uh, but we're at the same time, we're getting a lot of corporate governance questions as well, but it depends on the uh, board of directors, uh, internal policies, uh, composition of audit committee. So, so that's that's been varying a lot. And, and just taking advantage of my closing remark, it's the regulation is coming, uh, like uh, like we saw here, but uh, but actually the. The market already came, you know. So even even for smaller companies, I see that as an opportunity because uh, I was saying that are there are some European banks that are much ahead of any regulation. They have their own uh, KPIs that they ask. So it doesn't matter. We we have a, a sustainability report, and they receive it. They say that's fine, but I have a different set of questions that are complementary or not. So so it's coming. The investors also that. That are big investment funds, they have the green funds, that they are coming, they're very sophisticated, regardless of what again the regulation says. And finally, uh, even in your resources. So it's uh, I, I heard something a few days ago that it was very interesting that every day someone that doesn't care about ESG dies, you know, and someone who cares about it is part. So I think that's and we feel that it's uh, that is why that I showed when I talked to. 20 year old is something people, we have to go through that. Uh, they, they ask the questions, they, they are really interested in purposing. So I think it's uh, the main message is that regulation is coming, but the market already came. There is no standards of confidence they, they, they need to be prepared and, and, and it should be part, part of our business as otherwise. And the, the companies that are not prepared, they're not going to be here in five or 10 years. Thank you very much, Kleber. Uh, we are very short in time. We are going to try to finalize our panel by 4 p.m. Canada, 5 p.m. Uh, Brazil. Uh, we'll have uh, our closing remarks by Luciano Souza in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, before that, let me uh, shift to Camila. Uh, Camila already did a, a, a very interesting and comprehensive uh, uh, presentation, and, and I think, Camila, uh, you are the one panelist we want to hear about trends. So tell us in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a, a very concise way. I will. I will try. Coming? What do you see coming? <laughs> I will try, but, uh, but I, I'm going to be very brief. I think that when you mentioned there is a gap today between uh, investors' demands uh, and regulations. I think you are right, but uh, what I what we are seeing throughout the world in, in terms of regulation is uh, policymakers and and regulators trying to bridge this gap. And I think that's going to be made very soon. So in terms of regulation, I think that uh, uh, sooner than later uh, we will have at least. In, in, I can speak, of course, for Brazil, but other jurisdictions that we are following that uh, regulations are gonna be in place very soon. I think the other, uh, in terms, and now speaking of Brazil and, and Kleber just mentioned that, that in terms of um, financial institutions, we are also having a very important initiative, regulatory initiative in Brazil, which is uh, Central Bank. Uh, it's, it's very likely to put it to enact uh, uh, still in 2021 because public hearings of uh, re relevant regulations were uh, uh, were made public in the first semester with uh, two very important rules for the financial system, which is uh, considering climate change risk as a systemic risk for purpose of prudential rules for financial institutions in Brazil. And that is like this big change uh, for financial institutions and the way that they will treat uh, climate uh, uh, change as a risk uh, including for uh, borrowers and investors and clients in general uh, when considering their credit uh, analysis. So this is, this is gonna be huge. And the second rule uh, is that they are revising the 
uh, uh, the rules on, on social and environmental uh, risks and policies for financial institutions and also inserting disclosure requirements. So this will be this big change for the financial system. And we know that a financial system in the end, together of course with the capital markets, uh, are the ones that will uh, set the rules for companies in general, right? So I think this is gonna be a, a big, big uh, change in Brazil at least. Second thing, and this is generally, this is not only in Brazil, and I think we've touched on that, is the increase of shareholder activism, stakeholder activism, uh, better speaking. Uh, and I think that we've saw, we all saw and, uh, 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 and follow what happened with uh, uh, Exxon Mobile uh, and, uh, and Engine One, uh, this, this year in the US, they uh, recently in June, they brought their third uh, uh, member to the board uh, with an intention to, uh, uh, to revise what, what Exxon is doing uh, in terms of uh, uh, how to handle climate change and uh, a carbon reduction uh, 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 goals. So uh, if we think about bridging the gap on disclosure requirements plus at least in Brazil, changing the rules for financial institutions and how to handle uh, ESG uh, matters with their clients. And of course, shareholder activists, we will see an inevitable trend of companies trying to adapt and increase their ESG practices. So that's it. Thank you, Camila. Well, thank, uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for uh, the very interesting content that they brought to the table, really, a uh, uh, great job. I think uh, this is the, the our first panel of uh, our excellent series, and I think we started with the right food. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I see our vice chair, Luciano Souza, opening his uh, camera. I'm happy he he didn't give, give up on us, and he's still there. <laughs> Uh, and uh, he, he will he will uh, shed a light uh, now uh, uh, final lights uh, on the subject with his his closing remarks. So Luciano, the floor is yours. Wow! So thank you so much, Rafael. Thank you so much for our panelists. Wow! This was really impressive. Uh, we have launched our BCC ESG Excellence today with honors. Uh, and of course, this make my task here really hard. Uh, I think that I think no, uh, Rafael and Carolina mentioned that our objective here in BCCC uh, was to be a point of discussion between Brazilian and Canadian companies and on ESG matters. And I do think that we hap we this happened today. I, I think I really I, I really think this. Today we had a kind of a sort of history lessons, uh, history classes in a hot topic future uh, event. It's really amazing. And I will try to wrap up the main, the main lessons that we had today. Uh, well, first of all, I think that it's clear for everybody that we are shifting. Uh, I think Elisa mentioned about corporate responsibility to ESG. Is that the same? I think that Felipe mentioned, is that the same? I, I, I mean, I think that it is not. It's a kind of evolution of concept. Uh, man, Felipe mentioned that uh, society is really involved and that makes the difference. The second uh, uh, idea that we hear today is about education. Elisa and Rogério mentioned that they really cares about education. Uh, it, it is really it's super important, especially to bring on board, as Elisa mentioned, about uh, the smaller companies into the game. So another uh, point that was really interesting during this panel, and I try to make it short of it because I know that we are running out of time. Uh, we have, Camila said brilliant, that we have a new stakeholder model. Uh, we have the way they are treating ESG issues, uh, the, the companies are trying to find a way to show and to have, as soon as we, I, I mean, assuming that we don't have a, a general standard. So sometimes the investor get confused. So this is, was a kind of a background of our discussion. Uh, I, I took some notes here, but the idea is, uh, I, I think that my, my task here is to talk about trends. So I think the first trend that's very interesting is there is a lot of to discuss. Uh, there is a lot of to go over. Uh, first, because 
Kleber said perfectly, uh, regulation is coming. Uh, this, uh, the overview that Camila brought to us about the US, the Canadian, the Brazilian, EU, uh, uh, tells a lot about who is doing something, uh, what about to fill in this gap, about reporting, about the metrics, the compar comparable metrics. So I think that this is the, the, the basic, I, I mean, the main trend, if I have one, if I can just pick up one, is to talk about it. There is a lot of to discuss, especially in filling this gap about the regulation, how we put this uh, uh, in practice. Uh, how can we, and these, of course, uh, um, we have to keep up with the education. This is not a trend. I think that it's just to, uh, it's just to support this trend it's to talk about education. It's very important. I, I, I was happy to hear, Elisa, that we are, you are concerning about the smaller companies from bring into the game. Uh, and this maybe will help Felipe. I think that Felipe mentioned that uh, the perception changed from the first time in 2017 that nobody was talking about this and nobody was uh, asking him about this. And now he has to report quarterly. So, if you if you uh, stop to thinking about this, it's just five years or so, something about this. So it's all about education. It's all about to say, I mean, it's not only a, 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 an evolution of names, corporate re, uh, responsibility to ESG. There's a lot to do. There's a lot of to meaning in this. And in the end of the day, and I'm closing my remarks, Rafael, I think that the our objective, if you can say as a trend, is, is just to demystify the ESG. I think that once we have the regulation, education, we will reach this demystification of ESG because everybody talks about, about ESG, but actually it's hard to understand and to put in practice. So that was a sort of a remark. And of course, I would like to invite just to be, as a vice president, uh, those who are listening us up to now uh, and is interested in this kind of subject, no, uh, Rafael, it's really good. Please join us to the discussion. As I mentioned, our mainly tra trend here is there is a lot to discuss. So to discuss. So it will be great to have you here with your company, to hear you and to, to see uh, uh, new trends, to see new debates like this. So I will pass the floor to Rafael to finish or to Carolina, I don't know, maybe to Carolina. Uh, so that's my remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you, Rafael and uh, everyone else, Kleber, Camila, Elisa, uh, uh, Rogério and Felipe for uh, joining us here today. Uh, I think that this also another trend is that we realize that we cannot provide, provide a discussion like this in only an hour and a half. So lesson learned for next, we need a bigger time frame to put it to really uh, discuss and deep discuss everything that we wanted to say because it's very, very interesting. And as Luciano mentioned, there's still a lot to be learned and there's a lot to be uh, uh, um, uh, talked about. And I think that this is the objective of these sessions is really to to uh, uh, focus on important subjects for companies and for the Brazil-Canada relations. So we had today here two mining companies, uh, what is a big sector, and I agree with Rafael from the beginning. I think mining is uh, uh, deep into the SG mindset, and I think that there's a lot to learn from, from some things that they're doing as well. So I reinforce uh, Luciano's invitation. If you want to learn more about the BCCC and how we help our members, and if you wanted to really join this great community of ESG executive leaders uh, to be part of those conversations, uh, please let me know and we'll be happy to uh, explain to you a little bit more on how we can support your company. Uh, and I would also finally I would like to thank all our uh, sponsors, our annual sponsors, because without you, none of this would be possible. So Vale, Expert Development Canada, uh, Ciscon Barrier, Brookfield, uh, Lunging Mining, and the TSX and the TSX Ventures for your support. I would like to thank Proativa and Ciscon and Brookfield as the leaders of our SG committee for helping us to put this program together. And of course, all our panelists today, Aura, Nexa, TMX, uh, and BMI Law for, for your participation. We apologize for the delay, but we really hope that you enjoyed the content that we presented here today and that you continue enjoy, uh, engaging with us. So thank you everyone for being here. Stay safe and I see you all soon, hopefully in person uh, 
but thank you so much and uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.